Yeah, and I'm starting. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Montgomery County's Prevailing Wage Law Seminar. My name is Jack Jabala, and I am the program manager for Montgomery County's Prevailing Wage Law Program. <clears throat> Today, we're excited to have Deborah Wilder, a lawyer by training, um, with almost 40 years of experience in the wage in the prevailing wage law arena, uh, as our presenter. She is the president and founder of Contractor Compliance and Monitoring Incorporated. They are a firm based in California that does solely com labor compliance monitoring. For those of you who know, uh, California is kind of like ground zero for labor compliance laws. Um, so we're privileged to be associated with her. She has been with us since our law was adopted back in 2009. So, um, She's a nationally recognized expert in the field and has written three books on prevailing wage law topics. So we're pleased to have her with us and um, our sincere hope from the county's point of view is that that you've taken the time to attend this, that you walk away with a better understanding of the prevailing wage law. And to that end, uh, we always encourage people to ask questions. So please use the chat feature to do that. Bethany Manimbo of our office will facilitate that for us. So again, thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoy the presentation. Deborah. Great. Well, thank you all and good morning. Um, so again, I'm the president of Contractor Compliance Monitoring Inc. I have with me um, Steve Nagara, and Steve is the manager of our East Coast office, which is located um, close by right there in, in Maryland. Um, so for those of you who have not yet met Steve, um, he's here on the call and the phone number on this slide will get you to Steve, as will the email address um, on this slide. So we do this all over the country and um, I guess I, maybe I shouldn't say this, but one of my favorite clients is in fact Montgomery County because they are very proactive in wanting to educate their contracting community. So once again, um, I'm going to I'm going to go for about two hours. Um, we do have the opportunity for you to ask questions to put them in the Q and A box, um, and then we have um, Bethany who is going to be reading those and getting them to me while I'm making the presentation. And I hope to have some time at the end to offer some additional Q&A time for anyone um, who is interested. So let's just jump right in. I'm going to be talking specifically about Montgomery County's prevailing wage requirements. Um, the state of Maryland has similar requirements, but they're not identical. And then uh, the County Council recently made some changes to the, the county's prevailing wage requirements, and we're gonna take an opportunity to go over those new changes that become effective in July. So let's start with the county's prevailing wage overview. The county council adopted uh, the prevailing wage requirements in, uh, in September of 2008, and they became effective July 1. So that requires the payment of prevailing wages on county funded co construction in excess of $500,000. One of the changes County Council made that is effective July 4th of this year, that threshold has been reduced to $250,000. So at any point in time in which um, we have a, a contract that is awarded and it's over $250,000 that will trigger all the prevailing wage requirements that we're going to talk about today um, and those will apply to um, new projects after July 4th. 
Um, while the county has adopted many of Maryland's prevailing law provisions, they have not adopted all of them. So for those of you who maybe do work in other counties or work on state prevailing wage contracts, you might notice um, a slight variation and just know that again, we're covering the items um, in the Montgomery County's prevailing wage requirements. So let's talk about what is construction work. So it's a construction uh, is considered a work of improvement. Typically it could be a building, it could be a road, um, it could be a school, it could be a courthouse, it could be a library, it could be a transit center. Um, and so prevailing wage covers work that is performed on site, on the site of that specific project. Additionally, if you are performing work what is called adjacent or nearly adjacent to the property, that is also covered by prevailing wage. You know, people say, well, what does that mean? Well, maybe I have a sweeper truck and the sweeper truck is cleaning up around the street on the outside of the project. It's not physically on the project site, but it is right there next to the project and it is cleaning up um, and servicing the project. And so those are kind of the requirements. It has to be something that is particularly close by um, and it needs to be there servicing or providing some kind of service or support for the prevailing wage project itself. Um, the work that does, is not covered by prevailing wage is clearly things that are performed in your permanent shop. So let's just say you're a sheet metal contractor and you have a contract to install some um, duct work, some heating, ventilating, and air conditioning, HVAC duct work, and you manufacture those ducts in your permanent office. That work is not included as part of the prevailing wage package, um, but obviously all the work you perform while you're on the job site installing those ducts are covered by prevailing wage. A pure supplier delivery is not covered by prevailing wage. So let's just say we're, we've ordered cabinets to be placed into, uh, into the library. And when the cabinet manufacturer shows up with their trucks and they're unloading the cabinets, so long as the supplier is not um, installing those cabinets, just the mere delivery of the cabinets to the project site does not trigger prevailing wage. Um, professional services generally are not included in prevailing wages, and that would typically include things like um, surveyors and inspectors. Um, those are those the, that work is considered um, in the county as professional services and is not covered by um, the county's prevailing wage requirements. So let's talk about who's covered. Um, employees who are performing work on the project. So there are exceptions under the Fair Labor Standards Act, Section 541. If you have somebody who is in a supervisorial or management personnel, the requirements under FLSA 541 is that this individual is salaried that they supervise two or more employees on the project and basically they meet all the Fair Labor Standards Act requirements to be an exempt employee from overtime requirements. Um, so if you have an employee in that capacity, that um, that individual can be excluded. Be aware just because you're paying someone a salary does not exempt them from prevailing wage. Um, I, I've seen contractors who say, oh, we're just gonna make everybody salaried and then we're all exempt. No, that's not how that works. Typically you'll have maybe one person on the project who is exempt because they're supervising the project. Um, but everybody else who is working what I call with the tools, performing work on site, 
they're typically employees of the company, then they are considered um, subject to prevailing wage. Even if you had a lead man or a lead woman who was working with the crews, that lead person is also subject to the prevailing wage requirements. Now, every once in a while, I have a contractor who wants to tell me they've got 1099 employees. Um, would, legally, there's no such thing as a 1099 employee. The people who get, or the companies that get 1099s, are, are individuals or companies that are independent contractors. That means they have a business, they're operating that business, they have a business license, they typically work with more than one client at a time. This is not somebody that you put on your payroll and you direct them on how to do work. That might be a part-time employee, it might be a temporary employee, but they are in fact employees and those employees are entitled to all the benefits of an employee, which includes um, the, the taxes withheld, um, deductions um, that you may have to you may have to take out of their check um, to meet those state and federal requirements. Um, they're going to be subject to workers' comp. They're going to be eligible for unemployment insurance through the premiums that you pay um, for that for that benefit. So, um, if there's anyone out there who thinks they've got 1099 employees, I'm going to tell you they don't exist. And certainly, you're not allowed to have 1099 employees on any of um, our projects here at the county. I want to talk about how prevailing wage works, and some of you may already know this, but you know prevailing wages are set. There's a wage component, and then there's a benefit component. And so let's just say the wage component is $45 an hour, and the fringe benefit component is $12 an hour, and that gives me a total prevailing wage package of $57 an hour. There are a couple of ways that I can pay that. If in fact I have a robust um, fringe benefit package or many times if I'm union signatory, that $12 will be paid for the benefit of the employee and will go into some kind of health and welfare fund or dental plan or pension plan or whatever. Um, if I'm an open shop or a non-union contractor, I may have provided some of these benefits for my workers, and a list of bene a sample benefits are um, on this slide, and you can amortize and take credit for that, um, that amount of benefits that are paid. But let's say you don't have any benefits that you provide to your employees. Well, in that case, you'd have to pay the full $57, the $45 in wages and the $12 in benefits. You'd have to pay all of that on the employee's paycheck. But if you have some benefits, but not $12 worth of benefits, then you would still have to pay some of that on the paycheck. So for example, let's say that you had um, your benefits equaled $5 an hour. You'd have to take the other $7 from that fringe, ben fringe benefit package is $12. We're going to take credit for $5. The remaining $7 has to go on the employee's paycheck. So think of it as wages plus the value of the benefits you pay have to equal $57. So Again, you can split that between wages and benefits, or you can put it all on the paycheck, or you can put only some of the benefits on the paycheck. But at the end of the day, that employee would have to receive or have the benefit of receiving the, the fringe benefits that equals $57. So workers are um, paid based on the type of the tools used and the work they're performing. So it's not the title <clears throat> or the position that you hired the employee for or 
what their kind of what I call their default classification might be. <coughs> Excuse me. It is what are they actually doing that day? So let's just say, for example, you hired me as a laborer. You say you don't really know very much about construction. We're going to hire you as a laborer. We're going to start you out doing some basic things. OK, that's great. So I get to the job site and I am unloading the truck. That is clearly laborers work. And I do that again for two hours. Then the superintendent comes over and says, hey, we're a little shorthanded today. Could you go up to the third floor and help with the drywall? So I go up to the third floor and I start helping with the drywall. Well, after three hours, the superintendent comes up and says, you know, that's the worst drywall work I've seen in a long time. You're not going to do this work anymore. Come back after lunch and we're going to let you paint. So I come back from lunch and then I go and I end up painting. So I have performed three different types of work during the day. I have to be paid not less than two hours as a laborer, three hours as a drywall installer, and the, the remainder of my day as a painter, because those are the tasks I performed and those are the tools I used to perform that work. So I want you to think of prevailing wage as a minimum wage statute. You can always pay more. You just cannot pay less. So when you're working on these publicly funded projects, you just need to know that whatever that prevailing wage rate is, you cannot pay less than that to the worker or on behalf of the worker. Now, some people say, oh my goodness, I got to keep a record of all of this. So here's the deal. The employer is deemed to be the whole, what I call the holder of the records. You have the responsibility to accurately reflect the work that's being performed by your workers on the project and to pay them the prevailing wage for that type of work. Um, and typically you're required to keep those documents depending on funding sources between three to five years. So you should keep your time cards, you should keep, you know, your your project notes, you should keep anything related to the payment of wages and benefits for these workers um, for a minimum of three to five years. If when you get on the project, you find that there's not a classification that you need. Let's just say you perform. Um, you perform roofing work and for some crazy reason there is no classification for a roofer. Then you need to contact either CCMI, contact Steve, um, and then he'll in turn contact Jack or just contact Jack directly. And the phone number on this slide is Jack Jabala's phone number. And you also have his um, email right here. So you could send him an email and say, hey, Jack, I'm working on um, the library project and I need, uh, I don't see where there's a roofer's classification or I don't see where there's a communication and tech installer for the low voltage thermostat system that's being installed. Um, can you help me out? And then Jack will, I wanna say work his magic, but he typically will either go back to the state to see if there's a comparable wage rate or he can go to a neighboring county to see if there's a wage rate there that we can apply to this particular project. Just remember that if you're not finding your classification in the wage determination, the default is not unskilled laborers. I've had contractors put in unskilled laborers and I'm going back to them and saying, why? why well, what's unskilled labor here? You're supposed to be doing, say, electrical work or HVAC work or brick work or whatever it is. And they say, well, you know, we didn't have the classification, so we just made them an unskilled labor. No, 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 no. If you do not have the classification you need, go ahead and contact Jack, um, obviously, or CCMI, and we will help you identify the appropriate classification and wage rate. 
So again, don't assume that if you can't find the classification that you can just make everybody an unskilled laborer because that obviously is not going to work. All right, so let me talk about both the state of Maryland and Montgomery County's position on overtime. So it should be very clear, and I hope you all know this already, that if you work more than 10 hours in one day, overtime at time and a half is required. Um, and if you work your employees more than 40 hours in one work week, again, anything over the 40 hours is at, paid at time in one half. It also, all Sunday work on your prevailing wage projects are subject to the overtime pay. And then we have specific holidays that are required on your public works projects. Now, if you do not work on these holidays, you're not required to pay holiday pay to any of these workers. But here are the holidays through New Year's Day, Memorial Day, 4th of July, Labor Day, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. That's pretty easy six holidays to remember. But do yourself a favor and check the footnotes on the prevailing wage determination in case there are some additional holidays that might apply to specific trades. Somebody, some trade might also um, have the day after Thanksgiving. Somebody might have um, President's Day. So there could be other holidays that specific trades adopt. And if they have adopted those holidays, it will be on the prevailing wage determination. So before I go any further, Bethany, do I have any questions? Yes, yes. so we so do we have a question. We have a question in the chat box. We are a subcontractor and we have some Fed jobs. We submit CP through LCP tracker or EMARS or the GC requires sending them to the form, sending them form 347. When we send the form to the GC, do we need to send 347 form to any other place or we just need to keep copies of the forms we send to GC. So if you're working on one of the projects here in Montgomery County, Montgomery County uses LCP tracker and they will require all of the labor compliance documents to be uploaded to the LCP tracker program used for that project. Um, and as part of that, we require you know, the certified payrolls, um, information on fringe benefits. We may have other questions depending on what's going on. Um, so we generally don't require the 347, as I recall. Um, but if we did, you would only have to upload it to the e-documents and LCP tracker. Certainly, you're going to have to keep those forms. Um, you know, for at least three years after the project's completed. Okay, more questions? We do, we have one more question. If your hours in the contract is set for 4 p.m. till 12 a.m. every day for the next six months, if overtime rules applies. What was the time frame again? Uh, if, if your hours in the contract is set for 4 p.m. till 12 a.m. every day for six months. Okay, that looks like that's eight hours a day. So there would be no daily overtime. You would only have to then worry about the weekly overtime. So if you obviously worked more than five days in a week, you'd have some weekly overtime. Um, again, you know, if you're working at some place outside the county, outside of Montgomery County's jurisdiction, um, take a look and see if there any, are any special rules that would apply to swing shifts, because that's what it is. You're working a swing shift. Um, some jurisdictions in the country have um, special rules about working swing shift or graveyard, graveyard shift, um, but we don't have them here in Montgomery County. All right, let me just go ahead and move on and 
we'll, um, we'll, we'll stop again for questions a little bit later. So here's how overtime is calculated, because sometimes contractors um, don't quite understand this. So in this instance, we have a base wage rate of $25 and a fringe benefit rate of $10. And so when you calculate the overtime, you're going to calculate overtime on the base wage rate. It's going to be the $25 times one and a half, that's your overtime, plus then $10 for the fringes, and that's going to give me a total wage rate for that overtime hour of $47.50. You are never going to pay overtime on fringe benefits. So if typically what you've got is you're paying 25 in wages and you have a fringe benefit package which allows you to contribute $10 um, on behalf of the worker, this is super simple. But sometimes contractors have to pay some of that fringe benefit on the employee's paycheck. So let's just say you're, you're a contractor and you do not have any fringe benefits. So that worker still has to receive the value of $35. So $35 is gonna go on that employee's paycheck because you've got the 25 in the base wage rate and the $10 in the fringe. So when you go to calculate overtime, you still only have to pay overtime on the base wage rate. So you only have to pay over time on the $25, and that would equal $47.50. Now, that may confuse your employees because they're saying, wait a minute here, I'm getting $35 an hour on my paycheck, and I'm only getting $47.50 in overtime. That's not right, I can do the math. It, I know what time and a half of $35 is, and it's more than, um, 47.50. So I would encourage you on your employee pay stub that you list the hours and the base rate as one calculation, and then you list the hours and the fringe as a separate calculation. You could call it a cash fringe. You could call it, um, you know, fringe benefits. You know, paid on paycheck, whatever you want to call it. But if you show it as two line items, then it's much easier for your employees to understand that when you when they're working overtime, it is overtime on the wage rate, not on the fringe amount. So I would <clears throat> um, encourage you to, to be careful on that. Um, so the only time when you would use a different base wage rate is if the employee's normal base wage rate is more than the prevailing wage rate. So let's just say the employee normally receives $30 an hour. You cannot penalize the employee by reducing their compensation um, on a prevailing wage project. Now, if all you do is prevailing wage projects, so there is no real base rate, it's whatever the prevailing wage rate is, that's fine, but many contractors work on privately funded projects and public works projects. So if the employee's base wage rate on private work is more than the prevailing wage rate um, mandated by the county, um, state and federal law require that you pay overtime based on the employee's um, you know, normal base wage rate. Just want to point that out. All right. Um, I'm going to move on to fringe benefits unless there's a question in the chat box. No questions right now. OK. So let me take a minute to discuss. Fringe benefits when you get to count them and how you calculate them appropriately. So the first thing is, is that all the fringe benefits have to meet these five and sometimes six requirements. It has to be for the benefit of the employee. The employee must qualify for the benefit. The benefit must be definite and certain. Contributions must be irrevocably made, and they have to be paid not less than quarterly. 
some of the benefits have to be amortized, and I will talk about each one of these in turn. So obviously, the benefit has to be for the benefit of the employee. And you would say, well, of course it does. Um, so it's typically, you know, health and welfare, dental, vision, pension, you know, those are the types of benefits that are typically provided um, for the worker um, or for the worker's family. So if you're paying the premium for not just the employee, but the employee's family, that counts as a benefit to the worker and you get to count the, the full amount of your company's contribution in that regard. If you have a benefit where, let's just say you pay 85% of the benefit and the employee pays 15%, that's fine. You only get to claim the 85% that your company is paying for the employee. Every once in a while, I run across um, an employer who's doing some things that are not really for the benefit of the employee. Um, things I see include, uh, oh, well, I charge my employees uh, 50 cents an hour for the company's shirts that I make them wear on the project. That's nah, not really for the benefit of the employee. That's really so you can market your company and brand your company and just because you provide, you know, purple t-shirts to everybody with your company name on them is not really a benefit for the employee. So you do not get to charge the employee for something like that. I also had an employer once that had ins uh, life insurance policies for all their, those employees, um, but the employees did not get to choose the beneficiary. The company had the life insurance policies on all the employees and named the company as the beneficiary. Well, that certainly is not for the benefit of the employee. You can count life insurance premiums so long as the worker is the one who gets to choose who's the beneficiary. Um, the other thing I see is sometimes employers charge their employees for transportation, um, costs to and from the project, Again, that's kind of a slippery slope. It would actually depend on how that played out, but most of the time um, transportation provided by the company is generally not for the benefit of the employee. The second thing is the employee must qualify for the benefit. So you don't get to claim health and welfare payments on behalf of a worker if they're not yet qualified to receive those benefits. So many companies require an employee to work with them 30, 60, 90 days before they pay the health and welfare portion um, of the benefit. And so you could not claim the value of the fringe benefit medical payment for the employees, let's just say the first, first month they worked with you, because in reality, they are not qualified to re yet to receive that benefit. Um, the third requirement is the benefits must be definite and certain. And what that means is if I went and asked the worker, hey, what kind of benefits do you get? The worker can tell me. The worker can say, oh yeah, we get health and welfare and I get pension. Um, I don't need to know what their copay is on their prescription or the copay for the doctor's visit versus the emergency room. We don't need that level of detail, but the employee needs to know what the benefits are and and why they um, and you know roughly the, the the benefits even if they can't tell me all the details. Um, this brings up a fact I'm going to mention again in another slide, but um, there are some employers who have profit sharing plans, and profit sharing plans do not meet the requirement for prevailing wage credit, and I'll explain why because let's just say. I've got a company, we've got a profit sharing plan, but it's April. Number one, I don't know if the company's gonna make a profit this year. We won't know until the end of this year. So even if you said, oh, well, I wanna claim like a 10% benefit, because that's what we, 10% of the employee's wages, because that's the benefit we claimed last year, the, the answer is no, because profit sharing is based on the profit that's being made this year. 
And I don't even know if I qualify. Maybe there's a requirement in the profit sharing plan that I have to be employed at the time the profits declared. Or I have to be employed during the last quarter of the month, uh, last quarter of the year. Or maybe I have to work a minimum of 1500 hours to qualify for the profit sharing plan. Well, it's April. I haven't worked 1500 hours. It's not the last quarter of the year. I mean, I just don't even know if I qualify for the benefit. And then again, the benefit must be definite and certain. I don't know. I don't know what the benefit's going to be. Number one, there's got to be a profit. So I have to figure out if there's a profit. And then even if there's a profit, how much do I receive in compensation? Is it 3% of my salary? Is it 10% of my salary? Those yeah, that benefit is definitely not definite and certain as I'm standing here today. The contribution must be irrevocably made. Well, that's fine if we have profit sharing and they make and then make the contribution. It's irrevocably made, which means it's not forfeited when I leave the company. Um, but it has to be paid not less than quarterly. Well, profit sharing is only paid once a year after we calculate what the profits are and figure out the distribution. So there are many other benefits that are qualified, but a pure profit sharing plan does not. Makes you a great employer, but you just can't count your profit sharing towards meeting the prevailing wage requirements. So let me move on into a deeper dive to some of these. So for pension, the pension requirements is that your pension plan has to meet the Department of Labor and ERISA requirements. ERISA is the law that's the Income Retirement Income Security Act, and it governs what a bona fide fringe benefit is, including pension plans. So if you have a typical pension plan and it says, um, if you put a dollar in, we'll match a dollar, then you can claim your contribution in that match as part of a fringe benefit. Um, you might have a a fringe benefit plan that says uh, we're going to contribute 3% of your compensation to the plan. Well, then you get to count that 3% compensation that you're paying on behalf of the worker into the pension plan. There is, I call it a Davis Bacon, a DB pension plan, but it applies um, for all your work here in Montgomery County as well. And that is there are special pension plans that allow you to put money into them at differing rates. Now, most pension plans say, hey, you know, you decide how the contribution is going to work. Is it X number of dollars? Is it a percentage of my income? Whatever it is. But these special prevailing wage Davis-Bacon plans allow you to put in all of your fringe benefits for, from a particular worker <clears throat> into this pension plan. So let's do me give you the example where we had a wage rate of $45 and a pension, I mean, and a fringe benefit of 12. Well, if you don't have any fringe benefits, you're gonna put that whole $57 on the paycheck. And while it's on the paycheck, you're gonna be paying um, Social Security and Medicare on it, your, your match part of it. You're probably also going to have to count that whole $57 as um, compensation on the paycheck, which will impact your worker's compensation rates and could impact other insurance rates. So instead, if you took the $12 for fringe benefits and you could sweep it into this pension plan, the employee is 100% vested from day one. Um, so there's no forfeiture requirements. And so long as you make those contributions, not less than quarterly. Most of these plans require monthly contributions. Um, you get to then have put that into the pension plan. The employee gets a great benefit and then you save some money on your payroll burden and overhead costs. So um, that's just a special thing that is allowed for prevailing wage pro um, projects. And as I discussed before, a true profit sharing plan does not apply. Now, let me talk about amortization. So any of you on the call who are union signatory, your union collective bargaining agreement already provides 
um, your fringe benefit calculations on a per hour basis. So it could be $5 to health and welfare, a dollar to vacation holiday fund, um, you know, $3 to pension, you know, so, so your collective bargaining agreement already details the benefits out per hour, which makes it easy to um, report that for prevailing wage purposes. Many of you who are not um, union signatory and provide benefits, you typically get a benefit statement that says, you know, here's, here's your premium for these 10 employees for the month. And so you need to amortize, that's, that's what it's called, an amortization. You need to do the calculation to change that monthly premium into a per hour rate. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your premium and let's just say um, the premium is $600. So we're gonna take $600 we're going to multiply it by 12 months of the year. We're going to divide it by 2,080 work hours, and you're going to get a per hour rate of $3.46. So you can count $3.46 as the hourly um, premium for your health and welfare benefits. Now, you have to do that calculation for each employee. You don't get to just say, oh, here's the benefit statement. I'm going to use this bottom number and I'm going to, you know, divide it by the 10 employees on the project and that's what it's going to be. No, 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 no. The law is very clear. You have to use the actual premium that the company is paying um, for that specific worker. So let's just say, I got Joe on the project and Joe has premium is $600 and you're paying $500 of that. You and Joe's paying the other $100 out of his paycheck. So you want to get to count the $500 the company's paying and then you run this calculation. And then let's just say we have Sarah and Sarah um, maybe has dependent coverage and her premiums are $1,200 a month. And again, you're only paying 1,000 and she's paying 200. Well, then you're gonna use that $1,000 calculation and we're gonna say it's $1,000 times 12 months of the year divided by 2,080 hours. And that will give me $5.77. And that's the, the per hour calculation I get to use. Um, some people, well, I usually get asked, why is it 2,080 hours and can I use a different number? The number of 2,080 is allegedly all the, the typical hours in a particular work year. I understand construction's different. You know, some years it's slow and maybe your crews are only working 1,500, 1,600 hours um, a year. And sometimes, you know, it's everything's going gangbusters and your employees are working, you know, 2,200 hours a year. So um, the Department of Labor, the U.S. Department of Labor says the 2080 number is a good number. Use that number. If you want to use any other number, you are going to have to provide the proof of that number. Um, and so as a general rule, the proof is you're going to have to provide proof of all the field hours that were worked by your workers in the prior year. Um, a lot of agencies are uncomfortable with that and they're going to want to default to 2080. So if you use 2080, you're going to be good. Um, and I wanted to point that out. The other thing that you get to claim if you're an open shop contractor is vacation and holiday benefits. Now these vacation and holiday benefits are generally not paid to a third party. They're, you're just kind of keeping them on your books for when you know, a holiday occurs or vacation time is taken. These are the requirements. You must have a written policy that detail these benefits to your worker and the, the benefits can't be forfeited. So if you say to a worker, you know, you can earn two weeks vacation a year, but if you leave, 
you're going to forfeit that. That is not allowed. You cannot take any Davis Bacon or Montgomery County prevailing wage credit for that. If you say you accrue your vacation and, you know, if you leave your employment, you know, we're going to cash you out. We're going to calculate what you're doing vacation and we're going to pay that to you. So what you do is you calculate the number of vacation hours an employee will accrue in that year. You will calculate the number of paid holidays that your company pays. Maybe you don't pay any holidays. Maybe you, you know, maybe you pay five holidays, whatever it is. You calculate the total number of hours between vacation and holiday for that particular worker. You then multiply it by their regular rate of pay. And then you divide it by 2080 hours. And that will give you a per hour rate for prevailing wage purposes. So let me just say that we have five holidays a year. That's 40 hours. And I am on the employee earns two weeks vacation. That's 80 hours. So I have a total of 120 hours. I need to multiply that by the employee's regular rate of pay. What are they going to be paid when they take that holiday or when they take that vacation? So let's just say, even though the prevailing wage rate is $45 an hour, when the employee takes their vacation, they're only going to be paid $35 an hour. So I'll take those 120 hours. I will multiply it by the $35 an hour, which, the, which is the employee's regular rate of pay. And then I will divide that number by 2080. And I get $1.50 an hour. So that's one of the things that I can, um, that's how I can calculate vacation and holiday. Again, has to have a written policy, has to state how many hours or how many days the employee accrues. And none of that can be forfeited. If it's forfeited, you don't get to count that. All right, let me move on. So let me talk. Well, I'm going to move on to apprenticeship. So, Bethany, is there anything else before I move on to apprenticeship? Yes, yes. we do have a question. Uh, if you work three days during the week because of the weather, one couldn't work two days, and the GC asks you to work on a Saturday, will OT or straight time seems one didn't have a 40 hours week? Okay. So, Montgomery kids, let's just say. You didn't work Tuesday because let's just say it rained or there was a scheduling issue or whatever, and you want to now work Saturday. You can do that with no overtime so long as you haven't worked over 40 hours. Be aware, though, if you work Sunday. Sunday is an overtime day, even if you have not worked 40 hours. So keep that in mind. So if you say, hey, my work week is Monday through Sunday. Uh, we didn't work Monday and Tuesday. We want to work eight hours Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Nobody's working more than 40 hours, but the time that's worked on Sunday is an overtime day um, because it just says on, if you work on Sunday on a prevailing wage project, you get time and a half. Um, so again, Saturday work is OK if you're not going over 40, but if you work Sunday, you're going to have to be paying that overtime rate. Any other questions? No, not right now. Thank you. OK. Um, let me move on to the apprenticeship rules. So if for some reason your company, um, you know, has access to an apprenticeship program and you're going to be employing apprentices on the prevailing wage project, that also allows you to pay those apprentices a lower apprenticeship rate. So it's something less than the prevailing wage rate, but it's only for those individuals who are actively enrolled in an approved apprenticeship program can be paid these rates. So I can't go down to the street corner, pick up five people, put them in my pickup truck, say, you guys don't know anything about construction. I'm going to pay you as a third level apprentice, put them to work and then pay them at that wage rate. Those individuals are not enrolled, actively enrolled in an approved apprenticeship program. So those individuals are going to be paid the full journeyman wage and fringe package. 
Um, and I use the term here actively enrolled. It doesn't mean that, oh, they're enrolled and they're like, you know, going to start class in three months. Or, you know, well, yeah, they've been enrolled for the last four years, but, you know, they haven't been to class in the last three years. That's not actively enrolled. So it's individuals who are, you know, enrolled and going to their class or um, in that apprenticeship program. And um, Montgomery County and also the state of Maryland recognizes um, individuals who are in apprenticeship programs in Maryland, Virginia, or Washington, D.C. So um, the, uh, the, the, this change was made in 2018. It used to be you could only have, only pay apprentices the apprenticeship rate if they were from a Maryland approved apprenticeship program. Um, but that was changed in 2018. So if you have an apprentice that is in a program in Maryland, Virginia, or Washington, DC, you can pay them apprenticeship rate. If you have an apprentice that's enrolled in a program in New York, no such deal you're going to have to pay that apprentice journeyman wages so the exception for the apprenticeship is limited to those three states a couple of other points um, i want to include about the apprenticeship rules so apprenticeship is an on-the-job training program i mean they learn stuff in the classroom and then they come back and they apply it on the job and in order for that apprentice to appropriately learn all apprentices have to be properly supervised. Um, so if I see an apprentice on a certified payroll, I'm going to be looking for a journeyman in that same classification. So I can't have a carpenter journeyman supervising an electrical apprentice. That doesn't work. So if I have a carpentry employee, they can they can supervise carpentry apprentices. Um, I sometimes get asked, can my on-site superintendent or supervisor um, supervise my apprentice? And the answer to that is yes, as long as a supervisor has the skill set to do that. You may not have the um, superintendent supervise more than one apprentice at a time, however. Typically, apprenticeship has some type of journeyman to apprentice ratio. Most of those are maybe one to one. I can have one apprentice to one journeyman, but not always. Some of the trades say, no, you have to have two journeymen before you can have one apprentice. So we're, you know, so if you have more apprentices than you have journeymen on the project, we'll be asking you for a copy of your apprenticeship standards agreement because that's the agreement that the apprenticeship program had to file with the state and the US Department of Labor to become approved. And in that document, it will tell you the approved ratio, how many journeymen to how many apprentices. Um, the apprenticeship rules do not accept pre-apprentices. So if you have anybody in a pre-apprentice program, see if you can't get them in as a level one apprentice into the program um, so that we can count them. Um, all contractors shall employ competent workers and apprentices and may not employ anybody who's classified as a helper or a trainee. If you've been in this business as long as I've been, you'll remember that there were helper and trainee classifications um, available in many of the prevailing wage determinations. That went by the wayside easily 20 years ago, maybe 25 years ago. So if you have somebody, um, this typically comes up with plumbers because a lot of the plumbers collective bargaining agreements have a classification called plumbers helper. Nope, Maryland doesn't recognize it. Montgomery County doesn't recognize it. US Department of Labor does not recognize it. No helper classifications, no trainee classifications um, are, are allowed. You're going to have to then classify the worker in one of the other classifications that most closely aligns with their work. So, you know, maybe your plumber's helper becomes a laborer. 
or maybe the plumber's helper becomes a plumber. Um, you may not again use the helper or trainee. So here's where the county and the state differ. The state of Maryland has adopted a separate obligation to contribute a portion of the prevailing wage to training committees. Um, but Montgomery County did not adopt this requirement. So if there is a prevailing wage requirement, let's just say um, of this $57 and the state of Maryland says 50 cents of that $57 has to go to an approved training committee. Maryland did not adopt the mandated training committee. Now, if you are in fact um, paying a training contribution, say to the approved training committee that, that you're affiliated with, that's considered a bona fide fringe benefit and we will count that. But Montgomery County did not adopt the mandate um, of the training contribution. So before I move on to on-site interviews, do I have any questions? Yes. What if you work a job at the beginning of the week that is not a prevailing wage job and you work 32 hours? Then at the end of the week, you work a prevailing wage job for 16 hours. Do you pay the eight hours of OT using the prevailing rate, even though you didn't work OT on the prevailing wage job? Yes. Wherever that 40 hours gets triggered, that's where you're going to pay the overtime. So if you work, you work 32 hours on a private work and then you work 16 hours on a prevailing wage job, then you're going to pay the eight hours at the prevailing wage rate because that's the point in time in which you triggered the overtime. Let me give you the reverse of that. Let's say you work 16 hours Monday and Tuesday on the prevailing wage project, straight time rate, and then you went ahead and work 32 hours um, on a privately funded project. So the last eight hours of that week would typically be paid at um, the overtime rate when that work occurred. So that would be the private rate as well. Some jurisdictions require you to do what's called a weighted average over time under the second scenario. Um, state of Maryland, Montgomery County does not require that. So if you work in other states, there may be some requirement to do some kind of weighted average on the overtime performed on public, on private work. But under the scenario you gave me, it's when you hit that 40 hours, whatever triggers that, you're going to pay that wage rate as the overtime rate. Other questions? We currently have a time and material contract with Montgomery County that requires a JAF for each service call, for each service call that we provide, and each individual job is under the $250,000 threshold. But if you add up all of the jobs we provide in a year, it is more than the $250,000 threshold. Does the prevailing wage law apply? I will tell you yes. So because you're given one contract, it may be an open ended contract. You may not get any projects. You could get 20 projects, but um, if you typically are going to receive more than the threshold amount, then typically prevailing wage applies on that. Now, I'm not quite sure how that rolls out under the new changes the county council made. I think so, I can help out here. If thank you, don't you. Mind, Deborah. Yeah, thank you, Jack. Um, what, what, what the law says is that the contract value, currently it's $500,000, is going to reset to two fifty. dollars July 4th, but the key word is the contract value. It doesn't say task order value. It's the overall contract value is the distinction. Right. So in, in the example by the questioner, the combination of all those task orders equates to in excess of the threshold. So all of the work would be subject to the prevailing wage law. 
Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jack, for that clarification. Um, so there you go. So, you know, I, I think if you do work for the county, you should be able to anticipate or the county should be able to give you an idea. Perhaps in the contract it says this contract not to exceed X amount of dollars. Use that X amount of dollars as that threshold. So if they say we're going to have you do work not to exceed uh, $100,000 for this year, then you don't have to worry about any of the prevailing wage. But if the contract says, um, you know, not to exceed, um, you know, $500,000, well, now you've reached the threshold and it's going to trigger prevailing wage for each and every single one of those task orders. Okay, let me, oh, I'm sorry, is there another question? No. Okay, let me move on to on-site interviews. So on-site interviews are typically conducted once a month. Um, Steve typically goes out and does interviews, but we also have Delia Lopez that from time to time will do interviews. Um, they are both bilingual, so they can talk to the workers in English or in Spanish. Um, and the purpose of that is to kind of verify the information that's found on the certified payroll. Um, so we go in and we ask the worker, you know, what's your name? Who do you work for? What's your job position? We, we observe what they're doing. Uh, you know, how much are you making in prevail? Are you a journeyman? Are you an apprentice? How much are you making on this project? Does that include any kind of benefits the employer pays? Um, do you work overtime? If the answer is yes, do you get paid time and a half for your overtime? Um, I mean, those are just basic questions. I mean, so typically the interview is not very long and it should not really interfere with any of your work. Um, I do know that typically we do not come out when you're pouring concrete. This is, we all know that's all hands on deck and we're not gonna stop to talk to somebody about our wages when we're pouring concrete. Um, we don't show up if you're setting steel. Um, again, there's a couple of instances we don't show up, but generally we're out there at least once a month. We randomly select the workers. So we could get workers from two different subs on the project one day and we come back the next month. We're talking to, you know, three or four people from three or four different subcontractors. Um, or we could be talking to another worker from the contractor we talked to the month prior just because, you know, that's the luck of the draw. Um, so we take that information and we compare it against the certified payrolls. Now, I, I want to allay any concerns that if if your worker says, I, you know, I don't really know how much I, I make per hour and we'll say, well, you know, give me your best estimate. And they say, um, you know, I don't know. I make like 40, 45 bucks an hour. Um, and then we'll say, when well, do you get any kind of French benefits? And they'll look at me like, I don't know what French benefit is. I mean, does the company pay for like your health and welfare or is there a pension plan? Oh yeah, oh yeah, the company pays for, you know, 50% of my health and welfare. <coughs> so that's fine. Then we take that information and we take it back to um, the, the people in our company that review the certified payroll. And they will look for this employee's name on a payroll and look to see if the responses they gave were reasonably close to the prevailing wage rate. I don't need somebody to tell me that they're making, you know, $37.58 an hour. Um, sometimes people give me a, a gross amount they make. Sometimes people give me a net amount they make. But let me tell you what I'm looking for. I'm looking for one, to make sure the employee is listed on the certified payroll, because I found that has happened more than once, that they're not there. Secondly, I'm looking to see what classification they are classified as. So if I'm watching somebody installing floors, uh, wooden floors, I'm going to know that's carpentry work. And if I go back to the CPR and I'm seeing that the worker is classified as a laborer, then we have an issue because laborers get paid less than carpenters and the individual is to be paid not less than the prevailing wage work for the task they're performing. Um, 
The other thing I look for is a gross disparity in the wage rates. So I had an instance once where I was interviewing an employee and the employee very proudly told me they had just received an increase to $12 an hour. And I said, wow, that's really great. When did you get that increase? Oh, it was last week. How long have you been working on this project? Oh, I've been working on this project for three months. Oh, how much were you making before you got the raise? Oh, I was making 10 bucks an hour. Great, thank you very much. We are not going to engage your employee in a conversation about whether this is the right wage rate or the wrong wage rate. But you better believe when I get back to the office and I find somebody who's paying their employees 10 or 12 bucks an hour, when I know the prevailing wage rate is you know, 25, 35, 45 dollars an hour. That's the other thing we're looking for. We're looking for the dishonest contractor. All of you people who are, you know, out there and you're honest and you're trying to do it right. Then, you know, this should never be a problem for you. The other thing we look for when we go out on a job site visit is to make sure the prevailing wage rates are posted on the job site. Posting of the prevailing wage rates at each job site is required by the county law. So keep that in mind. And now somebody says, but you know, we're a road crew, we're out on the road. We don't have like a bulletin board or we don't have a, a trailer. Okay, keep the prevailing wage rate in a binder under the front seat of the truck, wherever you can. But um, there is, it's a requirement that the prevailing wage rate be posted and available to any employee who requests it. So again, we're randomly interviewing workers. We ask them to carry a recent pay stub with them. Um, we will typically ask for some kind of ID, so maybe that's a driver's license, um, and see if they have a pay stub with them, because we take that pay stub information and we cross-reference it against the certified payrolls. Let's move on to forms and certified payrolls. So certified payrolls are required to be submitted on all Montgomery County projects under this ordinance. And we typically use LCP tracker, so we're going to have everybody using LCP tracker to submit it. Um, and there's a very specific rule that payrolls must be submitted within 14 days after the end of each payroll period. If those are not submitted, there are liquidated damages that apply. So that's like a small fine or a small penalty if you do not submit the payrolls on time. So even if you submit them eventually, that's great, but that doesn't negate the liquidated damage provision. Your payrolls, I must account for every week from the time you start the work to the time you complete the work. So let's just say the project started January 1 you didn't start work until March. I don't need non-performing payrolls from January to March. I just need your first payroll, the first week you start on the project, label it payroll number one, and then I'm going to be looking for some type of payroll documentation until you're done on that project. So let's just say I work two weeks and then I take a week off and then I'm back the fourth week. I'm going to get certified payroll week one and week two. Week three, because you didn't perform any work, you're going to go to LCP tracker. You're going to collect, you're going to check the box that says, I didn't perform any work this week. And it's going to create what's called the statement of non performance. And that way I know you didn't perform any work that week. And it's just not that you forgot to turn in your certified payroll. Week four, you're back on the project. I get certified payroll. I will have some kind of certified payroll um, or notice of performance again for each week um, of the project until you are done. And when you're done, you're going to check the box. It says final. This is my final payroll. I'm done. Um, I won't be looking for any payrolls after that. If for some reason you get called back out to the project, that's OK. You're going to go in. You're going to uncheck the box that says final. You're going to put in several weeks of non-performance, and then you're going to submit your certified payroll for the additional work you perform. And again, once you're final with that work, you're done, you're not coming back to the project, or you think you're not coming back to the project, go ahead and check that final form. So 
I want to talk about this because this is super important. Montgomery County is, in my opinion, one of the leading counties in the country for um, their enforcement of the prevailing wage ordinance. But the obligation to keep accurate records rests with the contractor. So if I say I need to see your time cards and the employer says, well, we don't keep time cards. Well, then if the employee tells me they worked overtime, I'm going to have to believe the employee because you don't have any payroll records to show me that that's not true. So each contractor, you have the obligation to maintain complete and accurate records. That definitely includes time cards, canceled checks. I know a lot of you do direct deposits, um, but then I should be able to get the wage statement or what I call the paycheck stub. Um, and then the contractor is liable for underpayments of prevailing wages, not only for its own employees, but for all subcontractors and sub tier subcontractors. So it would behoove anybody who's who's operating as a general contractor or a prime on a project to um, keep an eye out and make sure that all of your sub and sub tier subs are reporting their information correctly and then they're paying their workers correctly. So liquidated damages applicable to any subcontractor is going to be withheld um, is going to be withheld by the county from any funds that are due to be paid to the prime contractor. You know, we don't have a contract with a prime contract with a subcontractor. All we can do is go back to the prime and say, hey, we have the subcontractor who hasn't paid the correct prevailing wage rate. We're going to have to hold this money. So that's your opportunity to go back to your subcontractor and say, hey, you know, they found this error. You need to fix this so we can, you know, get get the money released. So let me review the liquidated damages ever so quickly here. There's a $10 per calendar day for late payroll submission. So that means if you know you don't turn in your payroll for until 21 days after the close of the payroll period, that means the liquidated damages would be for seven days. That'd be $70 for the late payroll submission. Um, this doesn't have to be problematic unless you have a sub who, for whatever reason, doesn't want to submit their certified payroll. And then it can, it can you know, if they want, don't submit it for a month or more, obviously that can start to rack up some dollars. There's also a $20 per worker per day for a wage um, underpayment. This includes an overtime underpayment or a worker misclassification. So the liquidated damages are assessed even if the payroll is corrected and restitution paid. Um, I always have one or two contractors who say, oh, well, we paid, we, 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 we wrote the restitution check. Here's a copy of the restitution check. Um, will those liquidated damages go away? And the answer is no, they will not. So if you haven't paid your workers correctly, you're going to be required to submit um, restitution and the county can still assess its liquidated damages. There is also a $50 per day uh, penalty for not posting prevailing wage rates on the job. And let me just give you a liquidated damage comparison just in case you thought that Maryland was being, Montgomery County was being really crazy. So here's a comparison between Montgomery County and California. So if you have delinquent payrolls, it's $10 per day. In California, it's $100 per day multiplied by the number of workers you have on the project. So if you have 10 workers on the project, the penalty for failure to submit the payrolls in a timely manner is $1,000. Underpayment of wages or misclassification is $20 per day per worker for Montgomery County. In California, it is up to $200 per day per worker. Failure to post wages in Montgomery County is $50 a day. California does not have a similar penalty, but if there is an apprenticeship violation, those are assessed at $100 a day. So just so you can put some things in perspective. So here's a couple of links and resources. I'm, I'm not anywhere near done, but I wanted to make sure you had these links and resources um, for Montgomery County uh, with this presentation. So before I move on to the next section, are there any questions? 
No, not, no, right, not now. right now. All right, great. So now I'm going to transition into the new law that the county council passed, referred to as 35-21. So this is going to apply to all new projects on or after July 4th of this year. So just know that, you know, if you have an existing project and it's ongoing, you know, these changes will not apply retroactively. They're only going to apply prospectively for new projects on or after July 4th. So the prevailing wage threshold is lowered to $250,000. So if any of you have particularly, I want to say, you know, maintenance contracts or on-call contracts, um, that threshold will most likely impact you. The definition of public works, which triggers prevailing wage, now includes maintenance and repair work relating to resurfacing, pavement milling, and mechanical um, systems. So just keep that in mind if that's one of your trades. Mechanical means all of these things, HVAC, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning, piping, plumbing, electrical, refrigeration, and elevator. And the threshold for the mechanical work is the same as the threshold under the McNamara or, or O'Hara Service Contract Act. The Service Contract Act is a federal law dealing with um, services that are provided to the government instead of um, Davis-Bacon covers construction service contract provides service and typically things like maintenance. So it can inc include construction maintenance. The threshold for the McNamara or Service Contract Act is $2,000. So this is a big change for any of you who are doing um, mechanical maintenance of mechanical systems. The expansion of the definition of prevailing wage includes um, rehabilitation, rehabbing, routine operation, and repair for existing structures, buildings, or real property. Things that are not included are custodial services, landscaping, snow removal, window washing, and street cleaning. Um, so what I want to point out, these are for maintenance. If you have a construction contract and it requires you to install and maintain the landscaping until you turn it over to the county, obviously that will be covered by prevailing wage. But the ongoing services involving custodial services, landscaping, snow removal, window washing, and street cleaning are not covered by this new expansion. Prevailing wage also applies to some pilot programs. P-I-L-O-T is the payment, I should say payment in lieu of taxes, not is taxes. Payment in lieu of taxes means an authorized payment made by the owner of a qualifying housing development instead of paying the county real property tax. Um, this is a special instance, so I don't know how many of you um, do work with qualified housing developments, um, but in some instances, prevailing wage will apply to some of those as well. There is also a local hiring mandate, and none of you have had to do this in the past. So it requires that the contractor makes a best effort to hire Montgomery County residents for new jobs. So what that means is if you have your typical crew that's going out to the project, then, you know, and you certainly are not meeting this 25% because they're coming from other counties, not to worry, but the local hiring mandate is you have 25% for new jobs. So if you're going to go out and hire new people for your crews, Montgomery County is going to look and say, well, you know, is 25% of your new hires from the county? Or maybe you can say, hey, I hired one new person and they're moved from out of the county, but overall, I already meet the 25% requirement and then you're good to go. If for some reason you just cannot hire somebody because you can't find somebody with the qualified skills, then 
the um, the director of the Office of Procurement can issue a waiver or a partial waiver, but you're going to have to document what you did to try to find a county resident. You know, and I'm not here to suggest what what you need to do, but it could be like, well, you know, I purposely posted ads, you know, in this location, or, you know, I I purposely, you know, went to this job skills center or in this particular employment center and tried to find people who were from the county. Quarterly reports are due as to your local hiring requirements. So um, those reports will be coming out, um, I think soon. And I believe the first report will be due at in, in October for the first quarter um, ending in September. So just be aware that if you're going to bid on projects and they're going to be awarded after July 4th, that you've got this new local hiring mandate um, to make sure that local residents are hired. So I'm going to move on to Davis Bacon and how Davis Bacon applies to these projects. But let me see if there's any questions about um, the 3521. No questions right now. Okay, I'm sure there's going to be questions about this later. So um, feel free to send them my way or send them over to Jack Jabala because um, he can hunt down the answer for you. So let me talk about when F Davis Bacon applies. Davis Bacon refers to the federal prevailing wage requirements. And so the federal um, funding uh, threshold is $2,000 or more. So if we have a project in Montgomery County and there's federal funding in it, the federal funding will preempt or will control over Maryland and Montgomery County prevailing wage requirements. So we're not even talking about um, a project that's $250,000. If there is federal money in the construction project more than $2,000, that will trigger the federal prevailing wage requirements. I do need to back up one second because I made a reference for the 3521 that the threshold under the Service Contract Act was $2,000. That is incorrect. The threshold under the Service Contract Act is $2,500. The threshold under the Davis Bacon Act is $2,000. So, all of a sudden, we're on this federal prevailing wage project, and the Montgomery County rules I just covered, you know, do, you know, do not apply. So, let's go over what the federal requirements are for those projects. Number one, the wage determination has to be published in the specifications of the contract. So that doesn't mean, you know, that doesn't mean you like, um, they get to say, oh, here, go to wage determination MD 2022.0005 modification four. They can't make you go look it up. So we're gonna provide you with the proper federal wage determinations to, that apply to the project. And obviously we have to tell you that this project is subject to federal data speaking. So we're gonna let you know that. The wage rates are locked in at the time of bid. That means they're not gonna change. They're not gonna increase, they're not gonna change. These wage rates are good for the life of the project with a couple of exceptions. If for some crazy reason the project is not awarded within 90 days, then the, um, the county may choose to implement the current wage determination and will obviously provide an adjustment in the change order for you. For certain housing projects, if construction does not begin within 90 days of closing the project, uh, then new updated prevailing wage rates um, for Davis-Bacon will apply. But again, if there's a, an impact on your um, 
wage costs because the Davis-Bacon wage rate went up, um, you will in fact be entitled to a change order. So again, Davis-Bacon is paid based on the classification of work performed, not on job titles, not what your union agreement says. Um, and Davis-Bacon rates and classifications are not identical with Maryland Montgomery County rates. So the typical state prevailing wage rates are in fact different than the Davis-Bacon rates. So you're going to have, to, you can't presume that, oh, I'm just going to pay the Maryland rates because they're higher and I don't want to have to go look through this document. No, you do need to look through the wage determinations and find the craft classification that most closely aligns to the work you're performing. The Davis-Bacon Act used to cover surveyors um, a AM, which is called All Agency Memo 212, was issued in March of 2013, said surveyors are covered by prevailing wage. All Agency Memo 235 that was issued in December of 2020 says, just kidding, we're revoking this, surveyors are not included. Stay tuned, the U.S. Department of Labor is amending their regulations governing Davis-Bacon. It's the first time they've revised the, the regulations in over 40 years. Um, there is talk in those regu regulations of um, including surveyors again. So just hang tight. We'll see, uh, we'll see where that goes. But right now, surveying work is not covered um, by federal Davis-Bacon. If on some chance when you're looking at that wage determination, you're not finding the classification that you need. You're performing some kind, you're, you're installing window coverings and there's no classification for the installation of window coverings. Um, so you can request a wage determination even after the project started for the type of work you seek to do. And it's called a con the, the process is called a conformance and you submit a form called an SF-1444. I would strongly advise you not to try and do this yourself if you have not done them before. Please reach out and let CCMI help you make sure you've got all the information correct. The Department of Labor typically responds within 30 days. But if the information on the form is incorrect, they'll send it back and say this isn't correct, and then you have to fix it and send it back, and then they get another 30 days. So um, let us help you uh, make this um, request appropriately. So this can be requested at any point during the course of the project, but obviously the earlier the better. This is a copy of the SF-1444 form. Looks pretty simple, looks pretty easy. I never send in just the form, okay? Then the middle of the page here, this is all like project information up here, the name of the, the prime, the subcontractor, all that stuff. And then here, I'm gonna put in the classification, which is called window coverings. I'm gonna put in a rate and a fringe benefit payment. And then down here, if this request is by a subcontractor, I need the subcontractor to sign. I need the prime contractor to sign. I need an employee who's performing this work to sign or a union representative with their title and we have to check the box that says agree. If they check the box that says we do not agree, that will be problematic for you. Then down here on the bottom, the county is going to sign this and date this and hopefully they will agree as well. And then we'll send it off electronically, but the other things I attach to this is a scope of work. What is the scope of work of someone installing window coverings? Does window coverings mean blinds, louvers, shutters, curtains, some kind of special coating on the window? I'm going to describe what the scope of work is and then I'm also going to tell the conformance office what the basis for the wage rates are. So um, I got these wage rates from 
the collective bargaining agreement to which I'm signatory and here are the pages. I got this wage rate from um, a Davis-Bacon determination for the neighboring county or I got this from my employers association who does wage surveys or whatever the basis of it is. Because once someone gets this conformance in the office, they have to determine the scope of work and is the wage rate a reasonable rate? Well, I've already given them the scope of work. I just made their life a whole lot easier. And I've also told them what's the basis that I, for this wage determination that we're requesting. Um, under the current administration, I get these back on a regular basis. I mean, like two or three weeks ago, I sent one of these in and I am not kidding you. In two days, I have the conformance back. Now, I don't normally get it back in two days. Usually it's a couple of weeks. Typically at 30 days, if I haven't gotten this back, I send them a little email or I pick up the telephone and say, you know, I sent this conformance. I just did this the other day. Hey, I sent this conformance and we haven't gotten an, an answer. So I'm wondering, if it's stuck in the pile or you know it got lost in the process or whatever that is. Um, and then I typically will get a response fairly quickly from that. So this is what you do if you do not have a classification that's listed in the federal Davis-Bacon uh, wage determination. So with Davis-Bacon, you must pay your workers weekly. Hopefully everybody already pays their workers weekly. Um, some companies pay their workers like every other week or twice a month, um, but under Davis-Bacon, the regulations require the worker to be paid weekly. Um, the overtime authority for overtime after 40 hours in a week under Davis-Bacon is the Contract Work Hours Safety Standards Act, and it requires time and a half for all hours worked more than 40 in a week. Um, for the longest time, I think Jack mentioned I've been doing this 40 years, which is true. For the longest time, you would never see holidays listed in the Davis-Bacon wage determination. Um, however, they're starting to creep in. They've been creeping in for the last eight to 10 years. So if there is a holiday that's required under the federal prevailing wage determination, it will be listed in the wage determination. So if I'm looking at carpenters at the bottom of the carpenter section for Montgomery County, it will tell me if Veterans Day is a holiday, if Christmas is a holiday. Again, if you do not work on those days, you do not have to pay the holiday. Um, but if you do work on those days, then that employee is gonna get double time. They're gonna get paid uh, their regular rate plus uh, the rate plus a day for the holiday. There's this crazy thing that Davis Bacon does called the melded rate for overtime. I'm going to explain this and I'm going to then I'm going to tell you how you can legitimately not have to do this. This was brought about because there's a lot of employers out there who whenever overtime had to be worked, it was all worked by laborers, carpenters, electricians, roofers, you know, we're not listed as doing the overtime. They were all listed as, as laborers. And the Department of Labor says, ah, we don't think so. So if you do not have a written policy that says we're going to pay you um, the overtime rate based on the classification of work you're performing when at, at that overtime hour, and you do not have substantial documentation to back up what they were doing for that overtime hour, then you have to do this melded overtime thing. So let's just say we worked 47 hours in the week, 22 hours we worked as a laborer, 25 hours as a carpenter. And so we would calculate the, the wages and we would add those together. So the carpenter, the carpenter and the laborer compensation equals for all straight time hours, all 47 hours is 1,425. I divide that by 47 hours and it gives me this artificial wage rate. This is called the melded rate. And then I have to pay overtime on using that melded rate. So that extra, you know, there's time and a half. So I've already paid them one time on this. The extra half time hour, I'm going to use the melded rate. 
I don't know about you, but my payroll staff is quitting at this point because they would have to do this for every worker for every week. So my suggestion is you create a policy, you communicate it to the employees before they begin work. So I'm going to tell you it needs to be in writing. The employee has to agree to the policy and then you have to have sufficient documentation. The um, US Department of Labor says it's not enough that this is put into your employee handbook. So I create a form and I give it to every single employee when I am onboarding them, when they are coming to work for me. It's one of the many pieces of paper my employees have to look at and sign. And it says, this is this is company's overtime policy. We will pay you at the overtime rate based on the task you are performing during that overtime. Do you agree with this policy? I make the employee sign it and date it and I stick it in their personnel file. And then I have these two, these two checkpoints taken care of. I've had the policy, it's been communicated to the worker and the worker has agreed. So now the only obligation I have is to make sure there's sufficient documentation to support different overtime formulas. So my time card might say, just go back to this example, my time card might say, um, you know, 20 of those hours were labor hours because I've got them, you know, I've got eight hours and eight hours and four hours on Wednesday. And then I have four hours of carpentry hours on Wednesday. And then on Thursday and Friday, we have, we have, you know, eight hours of carpentry and four hours of labor. And then the next day or, you know, whatever it is, I'm going to play this out. So I have a detail and I know what craft performed the overtime. That's what you have to show. You have to show the hours worked and the craft that was performed during that overtime. In this day and age, so many people are logging onto projects and off of projects and, you know, with like swipe cards or with their phones or something. So somebody needs to make sure that your time records reflect the craft that was performed during that overtime. And then you do that, you don't have to do this crazy melded overtime rate thing. Um, federal apprenticeship rules are um, very similar to the state apprenticeship rules. So again, individuals actively enrolled in state approved apprenticeship programs. Maryland, DC and Virginia have reciprocity with the US Department of Labor and any of the this, those states apprenticeship programs are automatically accepted and approved by the US Department of Labor. So that makes your life super easy. Again, you must be employed in a proper ratio, either one to one, or if you have something different in your apprenticeship standards agreement. Again, all apprentices have to be supervised and the federal government does not recognize pre-apprenticeship programs. This form is the federal um, Davis-Bacon form, which is required to be placed on all federal projects. You can find this form in English. You can find it in Spanish. You can just Google Davis-Bacon form. Um, this will come up and you can put it on your job site. What you need to do is you need to put in this box, you either need to put CCMI's contact information with Steve Nagara's um, phone number and email, or you need to put Jack Jabala's information in here, phone number and email. This is because if a worker believes that they're not being paid the correct prevailing wage rate, they know who to contact to report this. So when we go out to the job site, we are going to be looking for the wage rates that are posted because that's also a requirement of Davis Bacon. You're going to have to post those wage rates somewhere on the project. You know, if you got a trailer, it's super easy. You put it in the trailer or, you know, maybe there's a bulletin board and we find some way to you know, put it in a plastic Ziploc bag and attach it somehow to the bulletin board. Um, or if you're in a truck doing a road repair, it's in that binder under the, the 
seat of the um, of the company truck. Um, so you want to make sure that you include this. And again, once again, you're going to put Jack Tabala's information in here or Steve Nagara's information in here. Um, so they're either going to call CCMI and, with a question about whether they were paid the correct prevailing wage rate, or they're going to call Jack, and Jack will probably forward them over to um, Steve and his office in Maryland. Let me talk about I-9. These are the I-9, the Immigration Reform and Control Act requirements. Um, you may not employ anybody on the project who's not legally able to work in the United States. The U.S. Department of Labor reserves the right to request and review copies of everybody's I-9 forms. Um, back in the day, they used to automatically request them. Now they don't. Um, but you should know that they can request them if they want. Sometimes, not frequently, but sometimes the U.S. Department of Labor wants to come out to a project. If they do, they typically walk the project. Um, I had a project um, in another state. We were out walking the project and 10 guys ran for their pickup trucks, which made the um, Department of Labor um, person say, hmm, what's the name of that company and I need to see all those I-9 forms. So um, again, you're already required to keep your I-9 forms current and up to date. Um, you're also required um, to e-verify your employees if for federal, um, for federal contracts. So um, many of you are probably already doing this and this is just a, a reminder of those requirements. So what I have here are Davis-Bacon contacts and links. So here is um, where you could find the wage determinations. Now I'm going to take, oh, wait, they've changed that website. So let me tell you what the new website is. And um, I have a couple of minutes left. I'm going to go show you where it exists. Uh, the new website um, is www.sam.gov. Sam is an Uncle Sam. .gov. That's the new website um, that they've put up. Um, they've been changing it a lot. So um, the current one is sam.gov. If you're brand new to Davis Bacon and need a little bit of an overview. Here's some general information. The U.S. Department of Labor has a booklet called the Field Operations Manual, um, and this is the link to the current manual. I know they're working on revisions, so I would expect a new operations handbook sometime before the end of this year. And then this is the Davis-Bacon um, Certified Payroll Form. You don't need to worry about that because you're just going to be using LCP Tracker and they're going to get us the information and that's going to be great. So if I could um, finish this and then I will take you to the um, federal website if we have time. So what happens if in fact you make a mistake on a federal project, typically they it's a reprimand. It's like, you know, you didn't do this right. You got to fix it. There's going to be no penalties or liquidated damages. Um, the federal government could debar you from public works for repeat offense offenses or gross violations. So like if you're taking kickbacks and everybody says, who's taking kickbacks? Every year I find some contractor who just thinks, hey, I pay way too much money in on prevailing wage stuff. So you're going to have to give me part of your wages back. Um, you will be debarred for taking kickbacks. Um, there is one monetary penalty, and that is for if you fail to pay overtime after 40 hours, it's $27 per day. And you'd say, why $27? Well, it used to be $10 a day, like forever. And then it was indexed. And um, anyway, so now it's currently $27 but it can in fact go up next year. So this year it's $27, next year it could be $28, $29, $30. It's, it's just indexed for inflation. So 
Um, I'm going to leave this up for just a minute. I'm sure you can. <clears throat> they're recording this, so if you need to listen to it again, um, I'm sure there's a way we can get you the slide decks. Um, this is our office in Maryland. Um, you're going to want to contact Steve because he's obviously in Maryland. He's got a phone number there and an email. I also have an email address, um, but I spend probably over 50% of my time in California, which is where we have our headquartered office. Um, so I can answer a question as well, but you're probably your best bet. Excuse me. Is contacting Steve. Now. Or. I get to that, I'm going to. Yeah, um, I'm. Now going to um, share. The federal website, just so you know where it's at. Um, OK, share this. Mm -hmm. Hold on. OK, so hopefully you'll see on your screen this page and it has Sam.gov with the little red, white and blue starry hat. So you should not ever really have to go here because anytime there's a prevailing wage project, the agency is supposed to provide you with that information. But I want to take just a minute so you know where to find it if you want to look. I'm going over here where it says wage determination. I'm going to click on wage determination. And then I'm going to check. I have Public Works, which is Davis Bacon or the Service Contract Act. I'm going to check on Public Works. And then I'm going to use the drop down menu to take me to. Maryland. I'm going to find Montgomery County. What type of work is being performed? Is are we doing a building? Are we doing heavy infrastructure work? Are we doing highway work? Or are we doing residential work, which is residential is four stories or less of residential? So I'm just going to pick building and lo and behold, here is the current wage determination. So I can pull up that wage determination and I can scroll through. Determination. Take a look here. There have already been five additional changes to the original determination. So this is why you need to always be looking in your current bid specifications and contracts for the wage determination because you want to be able to find the correct wage rate. So you'll see that these wage rates are slightly different than what you see on the um, Maryland Montgomery County wage determination. So wage rate and a fringe rate and you know, tile setters, tile finishers, bricklayers, millwrights, whatever this is. The other thing I want to point out here is you say, well, that's great, but I want to go, but I'm not working on this project. I'm working on a project that, you know, was advertised for bid back in January. You can go here to history and you can find all the other um, wage determinations for that year. You need to go back further. You have to make a formal request to the Department of Labor. Um, but if you wanted to go back and check on something else on another project, that is here too. So having said that, let me go ahead and see if there are any further questions for any of you. Yes. Yes. So uh, we have a question. Sometimes we work for two weeks, then go back two months later. Do we still need to submit CP for those two months? Yes. And so what you're going to do is you're going to submit basically what's called a statement of non-performance. 
It's super easy if you haven't used it before on LCP tracker. You go in and you can click one week or you can click multiple weeks and say we didn't perform any work that week. You click it, you're done. If it takes you more than a minute, I would be surprised. The reason we need to account for the weeks that you didn't work is we don't know. Did you work and just not forget to provide the payroll or you know, did you not work? And so statements of non-performance um, are regularly required on both Montgomery County projects, Maryland projects, and federal data vacant projects. And then we have a question. If you were awarded a time and material contract in September 2021, and the contract is for one year, does the prevailing wage law apply for this contract? There's an option to renew for three additional one-year periods. Will the prevailing wage law apply at the renew date or go back to the original date of the contract? So first, if the value of the contract exceeds the threshold, currently it's $500,000, July 4th of this year, it's gonna be $250,000. Then the answer is yes, prevailing wage will apply. Um, I'm going to let Jack jump in here in a minute because with the renewal options, will the will the wage rate that you bid the contract act apply or will you have to have an update? To me, it depends on whether or not the county is opening the contract for you to provide um, wage adjustments because my belief is if you're offering them wage adjustments, then that's the opportunity for you to cover any increase in prevailing wage. But Jack, do you have a comment on that? Yes, uh, thanks, Deborah. The law reads that the rates in effect are valid for the duration of the contract. So if we're talking about a contract that's the same contract, just with additional years of renewal, but it's the same contract, same contract number, then the rates originally posted in the solicitation are good for the duration of the project. However, as De Deborah implied, if it's a different contract, even though it's the same work, that contract should be should have been based on another solicitation that superseded the initial one. Right. And would have different rates. I hope that clears it up. OK, more questions? Yes. Uh, we are a subcontractor on a Montgomery County public school project. Um, I've been instructed to submit my certified payroll to the DLLR website. I use Sunburst software that works with QuickBooks. Do I need to also use LCP Tracker? No, LCP Tracker is required for all the Montgomery County um, issued contracts. It sounds like this is a contract um, with a school district, not with the Montgomery County. And so the school district gets to dictate to you um, how they want their payroll delivered. So that's not our project, so we would not require um, LCP tracker. Thank you. And those are all the questions. Oh, I see one more. Uh, if you have an existing Montgomery County, who would be the best to talk to about the contract and how will it be affected? Would it be the contract administrator? Um, I think that's a question for Jack. Does it say what they're after, Bethany? In any, it... Um, it just says if you have an existing Montgomery County, who would be best to talk about the contract and how will it be affected? Just, would it... Just, they can call me, just, just have them call okay. me. Email's probably better. We, we don't work five days a week in the office now yet, so email would be the preferred method to communicate with me. Okay, is that the last question? Uh, yes, that is the last question. Okay, so let me just, um, you know, if you, if you have a specific question about um, the Montgomery County contracts, you have my email that was on that final slide. Feel free to email me to answer that question, or you can email it to Stephen. Um, and if we can't answer it, we'll get it back to, um, and this is Stephen that everybody can see. There we go. He's our East Coast manager. Um, 
so again, you know, we're here. We're, I'm not interested in sandbagging any contractor. I'm interested in helping you understand what Montgomery County requires and getting everybody across the finish line with a beautifully complete project and everybody in compliance. Um, so I will stick around. I have five minutes left. I'm, I'm more than happy to stick around and answer some more questions. Um, but I want to thank you for taking two hours out of your day um, to get this update. I think the changes in um, the new law effective July 1 will impact several of you. And so I'm hoping that this was helpful. Having said that, let me turn it back over to Jack or Bethany if there's any more questions. We don't see any more questions right now, uh, but maybe people will type their questions in the next couple of minutes. Yeah, okay. let's give them some time, OK? If that's OK with you, Deborah. Yeah, I'm perfectly fine. I've got, like I said, I've got another five minutes here. We're happy. Great. We're happy to uh, to do that. In the meantime, thank you so much for a, a superlative job. Oh, you guys are most welcome. Um, Jack, do you have any idea when the local hiring form reports will be available or? We haven't huddled up yet. OK, OK, I suspect they'll be ready probably at the end of September because the first reporting period would be then. Um, well, there'll be a lag between the time th that takes effect on July 4th and the time a, a contract would be awarded. Right. So I suspect it will be probably closer to the end of the year before. Right. The rubber hit really hits the road. All righty. So I'm not seeing any more questions. I don't see any more questions, uh, but I did just want to make an announcement that we will send a survey out to all registered attendees after this session is over. Uh, so please take a minute or so and fill out the brief survey. That would help us tremendously. Thank you. And I don't see any more questions here in the chat box. All right, so let me just thank you all again for attending and I'll turn it back over to Jack. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending and thank you especially Deborah for all your efforts and Bethany, you as well. You uh, outdid yourself as normal. Take care. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. Please check your email for a survey link shortly.